Support for This American Life comes from Audible.com. With an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. For a free 30-day trial, including a free digital audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash American. And from Mozilla, the nonprofit behind the popular web browser Firefox. Mozilla believes in an internet for people, not profit. Learn why they think the internet is a global public resource that's worth protecting at mozilla.org. This American Life, Myra Glass. Okay, so much has already been said about this week's news. And so what we are going to do today is very simple. We have people from all over the country, all walks of life, absorbing the news and getting to talk about what they are feeling and thinking. Some of these people you may agree with, some you will not. This has been a year where it feels like the two sides are so radically far apart. But of course, we all live here in this country together. We are all facing this future together. What are we feeling right now as we do that? And I'm just going to start right in on our first stop. Aquan, Southern Florida. Our producer, Mickey Meek, met these two uh, police officers. Uh, they were both Latino, both voted Obama in 2008, then Romney in 2012, and then Donald Trump this week. It was Thursday, middle of the night, and I was in the parking lot of a restaurant in South Florida where these two officers were taking a short break. The news of President Trump had been out for exactly 24 hours, and they were still in shock. The results came in just as they were checking out a burglary at a local business. They turned and said to each other, This is almost as good as the Dolphins winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I didn't know. I looked at the Miami Dolphins. The last time they won the Super Bowl, 1974. We never expected it, and it just all of a sudden it happened. This is Nick. He and his partner Alex said they'd talk to me, as long as I didn't use their real names or say what police department they worked for. Also, we had to kind of hide behind their SUV, just in case other cops drove by. Nick and Alex aren't supposed to talk to the press. But like a lot of police officers, the last couple years have been pretty rough for them. And hearing Donald Trump be called President Trump, it calmed them. Here's Alex. Right now is what we're thinking of. It's um, He's going to install members of his cabinet that are going to be more law and order. Then Nick jumped back in. It, it was actually just a relief, like saying, God, maybe now there's a change in directions. Maybe now it's not okay to go out and riot in the streets and burn down buildings saying F- the police. Maybe there will be hope. Maybe somebody's up there that could change that and say, hey, enough is enough. Here's an example of how they're treated. The night before on election night, they stopped by a restaurant. There were a lot of people standing around a TV, and Trump was on giving his victory speech. And we asked to turn up the volume so we could listen to what everyone was saying. And <laughs> one particular person said, no, we're not going to raise the volume on the TV. Someone else reached over and turned it up for them. That person got extremely upset and said, why are you raising the volume for these people? And it's, the person just shook her, you know, shook their heads and walked away like in, like, like in disbelief, like can't believe we got to let these cops listen to what the president has to say. Like, what's the emotion that you felt? It's kind of like for many years, you're kind of like down under a rock. And then finally, you kind of get used to living down there. You go to any bar, you go to any uh, uh, gathering, a barbecue, or anything like that. And the first thing, hey, what do you do for a living? Yeah. And, and you're like, here we go. You know, it's like the last thing I want to tell people is I'm a cop. I am a firefighter. Is that you tell people? No. Firefighter. What else do I tell people? I sell pharmaceuticals. I don't even know. I've come up with the weirdest things. But it's people's demeanor ex- immediately changes. What does it look like? They're just like, oh, oh, everything changes. Even if they're holding a drink, they'll put it down. Although Nick and Alex were both Obama supporters in 2008, they felt let down by the president and the Democratic Party. They didn't like how policing issues had been handled over the past few years. It was a lack of support. Obviously, it was 100% a lack of support. Basically, right now, when a police officer is involved in anything, we are guilty until proven innocent. You're supposed to be for everybody. You're the president of everybody. And then during this election, the way it ran and the way he supported Hillary, and Hillary's number one thing was, hey, let's bring up victims of these shootings. Let's bring the Black Lives Matter. Let's bring out artists that sing against police. We're good guys, they kept saying to me. We're not all bad apples. Both Alex and Nick are up front that Trump has done things that trouble them. All the stuff he said about women, it shocked them. And also... He's inexperienced. 
and I think he's very hot-headed. And when you're a man of the power that he is now, any wrong decision could cost a lot. Is he the answer that we're looking for? Who knows? But for the moment, he feels like their best bet. Mickey Meek. Act two, a Metro North train. Okay, so next we head north. One of our producers, Neil Drumming, talked to somebody who was not happy with the results of Tuesday's election at all and was trying to figure out how to brace herself and think about the coming days. Wednesday morning, my friend Janelle posted a comment on Facebook. Janelle's a stand-up comedian, so this stood out to me because it wasn't at all funny. But it was a thing a lot of my black friends had been saying on social media in the hours after the election. Her post read, All the older black people I've spoken to this morning, including my mom, are not surprised. Straight of back and calm as so I will strive for the same. The next day, I called Janelle to ask her about it. She was on the train headed into New York to do some gigs. What did your mom say? Or what did you ask her, and then what did she say? Well, my mom is like one of those people that stresses out over the littlest Like, she watches, she checks, like, the weather where I live and, like, tells me when storms are coming up. <laughs> so I called her thinking she would be freaking out. I mean, I was freaking, I was freaking out. Wait, what kind of state were you in, first of all? Oh, I was, I, I didn't sleep all night. Like, I was really feeling, like, real stressed, like, physical pain stress. And then so, so the, when you called your mother, mother, like, how was she on the phone? She was like, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I called her thinking she would be even worse than me, and she was so chill that it was surprising. I called her, and I was like, can you believe this? She was like, you know where we live? That's what she said, you know? She said, you know where we live? Yeah. Janelle's mother means the United States of America. When she told Janelle, you know where we live, she meant, in a country with a history of racism that runs so deep, you as a black person should not be shocked by the results of this election or anything else you may witness in the near future. Stay cool. Like, I've heard that sentiment a a few times now, and does it make you feel better? How does it make you feel? Just kind of resigned. I feel like that's how black people are. We're just like... This is how it's going to be. And, um, you know, we get, like, little moments of reprieve, like, I guess, Obama here and there, but it always just comes back, you know? Like, we're just always waiting for the shoe to drop, and it's a, a ever-present thing that we have to deal with, this feeling of being just always in danger is how I feel, you know? Mm-hmm. Surrounded. Like, so half the country now, they, like, literally half the country, I don't know who the f- is sitting next to me, closed mouth, smiling about this. F- you know what I mean? <laughs> and you travel a lot, right? You're on the road in all of these towns. Yeah. I feel like I'm uh, not under siege, but, yeah, I just um, don't feel safe. Whereas maybe before I, I had forgotten. That's what happens. You forget. And then this shit happens. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, we know where we live, <laughs> like my mother said. <laughs> like, that's basically what she was saying, like, oh, you forgot. I guess if I was you, I would feel genuine. I mean, I'm concerned myself, but it's like the notion of going from these, you know, going around these towns, it's like you're going to see mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like for most uh, black people, it's not that it's Donald Trump. It's what he represents, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so those... those um, People have already, you know, been coming out of the woodwork. You know, there's already been reports of people uh, walking around with black faces, walking up to people saying, like, we can say that now. This jerk. He represents jerks. These who hate their life and just mad at the world and want to lash out. Do you feel emboldened at all? Do you feel bolstered at all by what your mom said? Like, is there, I mean, not just is there a silver lining for you, but it is, are you confident? It just calmed me down. I'm not like, oh, now everything's going to be fine. I'm still like super just on alert. That's how I feel like my body is just like on alert. (laughs) You know what I mean? Danger, danger. Like that's how my body feels. The story from Neil Drumming. Act three. Trump Tower. So we've all been witnessing this historic campaign in this election together. 
But some of us have front row seats on that. And our producer, Karen Duffin, went to talk to somebody who actually knows the man who is going to be the president. Here she is. Last week, a few days before the election, I spent an hour inside Trump Tower where Donald Trump lives, talking with a friend and neighbor of his, a guy named George Lombardi. I mean, you are here. I, I wish your audience could see. I've got two pictures here, one of George Bush Jr. and one of George Bush Sr. with myself. You know, I got also Rudy Giuliani. I got also the Pope and the Dalai Lama. But anyway. His living room is littered with pictures of famous people. I couldn't see any of Trump from where I was sitting, but they've been friends for over 25 years now. In June of last year, I said, Donald, are you really serious about this thing for president? And he goes, yep, I'm determined I'm going to do it. So he signed on to help his friend out. He organized volunteers for Trump. And when we talked last week, he told me something that at the time seemed to me and probably every pollster in the country a little like wishful thinking. There might be a big surprise on November 8th. Do you think there will be? Absolutely. I wouldn't be surprised if we get 48 states. Really? Trump did not win 48 states. But when I called George this week, it was, of course, a very different conversation. So so do you want, do you want the chance to say I told you so, Karen? No, absolutely not. No, no, no I mean, honestly, the, the, you know, the, 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 the margin was so small that, uh, you know, if I have to give you know, really responsibility for the victory of Mr. Trump is to the almighty God, because only God could pull something like that, frankly speaking. Um, have you spent time with uh, President-elect Trump since since the, the victory? No, I saw him here in the building uh, just as he was walking away from... Uh, from the building going to the Hilton uh, for the, you know, for the speech. At that point, it wasn't yet 100 percent. George told Trump, hey, we're having a victory party in the building and you should come. He, he looked at Melania and she said, well, maybe two minutes. But then the Secret Service said, no, you know, you cannot go unless we, we check the, the, the premises first. He said Trump looked at Melania, said maybe two minutes. But the Secret Service said no. So he said, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm a slave of these guys now. As Trump walked away from him, George says he seemed serious. Mike Pence, too. Like the gravity of what they might be about to take on was finally sinking in. The, the size and the magnitude of, of, of the job ahead, you know, leading basically the destiny of the world, you know, for the next four or maybe eight years. How do you think this is going to change him? Like, who, who do you think he's going to be in four, four years as a person? You know, Mr. Trump <laughs> and President Trump are going to be remembered as completely different people. George says he can already see this in Trump's acceptance speech at the White House with President Obama. This is, it, it's not... Uh, uh, it, it's not the same man that did the campaign. Hmm. This is a different man. Are they going to let him keep his Twitter account? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye. Karen Duffin did that story. Of course, Donald Trump has started tweeting again. Act four, Los Angeles. So the day after the election, the board president of the Los Angeles Unified School District put out this statement. As students and staff arrive at school today, we know there may be feelings of fear and anxiety, especially within our most vulnerable communities. The district is providing additional supports to those who need it. Latinos make up 74 percent of the student body there. Our producer, Jonathan Menjivar, checked in with a teacher who he knows. I'm going to let you eavesdrop on this conversation that happened this week. So... I mean, we're just, is it okay if we just talk normal, Jonathan? Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. So, you know, it was a school night last night, so we had to go to sleep. This is my cousin, Angelina. I talked to her the day after the election. She's a kindergarten teacher. She teaches in this bilingual program at a school in L.A., in Highland Park. There's lots of immigrant families. So Wednesday morning, she got up and learned that Donald Trump would be the next president of the United States. 
She had 10 parent-teacher conferences scheduled that day, a full day of classes. So at the first conference, she and the parent sit down, 7 o'clock in the morning, and they both start crying. We only had 15 minutes to talk, so we kind of said, okay, we're going to do this for five minutes, and then we're going to talk for 10. This is how every conference started. A download on the election, sometimes with crying, and then they talk about how the five-year-olds were doing. It was hard to avoid the historic news. It's sad what's happening, this mom says. Angelina says, it's hard, it's hard. But I hope that something good comes out of this, she says. Did something good comes out of this, Angelina asks. I hope that he doesn't do everything that he says he's going to do. That he does something good. We need to think positively that he'll do something good. So after Angelina's morning conferences, the kids arrive for school. She picks up her class from the spot where they line up. And one of the kids, he yells out, Donald Trump is president. Then when we got into the classroom, um, another student said, um, I'm really afraid because he's going to build a wall. And then another student shouted, he doesn't like brown people. And I have a mixed class. These are not just Latinos in my class. Mm-hmm. I have a, a culturally, you know, ethnically diverse classroom. And um, one of my students approached me and said, I'm really sad. I'm going to, I'm leaving this school. And then I said, where are you going? You know, kids move schools. And I said, where are you going to another school? And he said, no, I'm going to Mexico. And then I said, when are you going? He said, I'm going right now. And I thought it was kind of, you know, like an imaginary conversation. Yeah, yeah. So I said, "Um, oh, are you going on vacation? He said, no, I'm leaving because Donald Trump is the president now. And I'm leaving and I'll never come back and I'm really going to miss you. And I just was shocked. And Helena doesn't think this kid is actually leaving. It's just a five-year-old digesting the news. And it was constant. It was all day long. Um, And so, you know, I had to tell the students, you know, you spend your day at home and you spend your day with me and you're protected at home and you're protected at school. Nothing bad is going to happen to you here as long as you're home. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can only speak for home and school that everything is going to be okay. Angelina says she doesn't know the immigration status of her students. It's just not something you're privy to as a teacher. Trump has said he wants to end illegal immigration entirely. The question is, will he deport the 11 million undocumented immigrants who are already here? Something he said during the campaign, but seems to have backed off of now. In the absence of information, the kids and parents, they're filling in the blanks. It's like, it's hard to believe. (laughs) Yeah. How could this be? This is another one of the conferences. This mom told my cousin that she has an autistic brother. You can see it when you look at him. So Donald Trump's imitation of a disabled reporter. It's not okay. It's not right. (laughs) Yeah, it's not right. He's just... Who is he to talk to someone like that? So I've been crying all day (laughs) (laughs) with all the parents that I meet. Yeah, because it's hard, you know. I have my 11-year-old. And it's hard to explain to him. He's just like, how did he win, Mom? Like, he even says, you said he wasn't going to win. And then I said, you know, he just doesn't have that much power, though. It's on him, you... You know, just stay calm. And you know, he's worried about people getting deported, mainly families getting separated. It's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, let's do our conference. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Angelina told me that this day, processing all of this with parents, was exhausting. She crawled into bed as soon as she got home. Jonathan Menhivar.
Deck five, Long Island. So next we have two guys from the election was not just about choosing a politician. It was about choosing the new boss. Producer Stephanie Fu hung out with them and recorded their conversation. It's the day after the election, and I'm sitting in a diner in Long Island with two Army officers. They're both in the same unit in the reserves. They both have other jobs, but they could be deployed at any time. They've worked together for about two years now. One of them voted for Trump. The other voted for Clinton. Why do you like each other? Uh, I don't know. Why do we like each other? We disagree on almost everything. You know why? Because... <laughs> I know that he'll have my back and he'll and I'll have his, regardless of what he believes. Although it's ill-founded, most of it. Yeah, he's awesome. I give my life for him. I'd save my own life. No, <laughs> he know he knows where it. Where yeah, we're he is. good. I'm not using their real names in the story. Tom's the Clinton supporter. He's eating a stack of pancakes and is wearing a periwinkle blue button-down shirt and matching V-neck sweater. Chet is the Trump supporter. He's drinking a double shot of whiskey and wearing flannel over a Millennium Falcon t-shirt. These two guys have a text chain going with a couple other officers in their unit. Sometimes they're planning training exercises, but mostly I get the feeling they're just complaining about their girlfriends and sending each other South Park memes. And the morning after the election, Chet texted Tom. I say, hey, you doing okay, Tom? Didn't have an aneurysm, did you? I go, I'm practicing meditative breathing, preparing for the end. So then I respond, ha ha, it'll be fine, buddy. I saw this coming. So, and this is where I say, so did I. That doesn't mean it's going to be fine. Lots of people feel like their lives are going to be impacted by this election. But this is the person who could deploy these guys, send them to risk their lives in combat. And on this point, they agreed. One candidate was way more likely to do that. Who's, so, who's more likely to send us someplace? Hillary. Hillary. Hillary Clinton had talked about establishing a no-fly zone above Syria. And both men agreed. That sounded like a big first step towards war with Syria. Here's Chet. Listen, man, I was in Iraq and I was in Afghanistan. As far as, far as I'm concerned, I don't need to go to another country to fight another civil war. Let those people work it out. It sucks. My question is, it's not that we shouldn't help people. It's at what point, man, at what point do I need to keep helping at what point do we as Americans have to keep helping the rest of the world? I tend to agree with him that I don't want our forces there. But I do not agree with the isolationist policies that Trump is putting forward. I believe that a strong American footprint internationally is important. So that's the big picture. But the small picture is they both think that under a Republican, more money might come into the army. Maybe their unit will get more money for training, for supplies. But then there's the issue of the recruits. Most recent numbers I could find, in 2008, 65,000 members of the armed services were immigrants. Chet and Tom's unit is really diverse. And Tom's worried that that could change, that fewer people would sign up to be in the U.S. military as a path to citizenship. You're looking at, what, I don't know how many soldiers I've met that still weren't American citizens. But and, he's and talking a very small joining, minority. No, so your fear they don't get citizenship is because your fear is that we would get less of those people that would be invested in the in America if Donald Trump is president. Yeah, You're saying all right, you know what this this isn't worth fighting for anymore. They don't care about me, and there's I'd have a lot more faith in them to vote for the next president or to participate in the American process than a lot of people that were born in the United States. Yeah, I do too. And then, of course, there's the biggest question of all, the actual, for real, apocalypse. Lots of people this year have questioned whether Donald Trump is too erratic to be trusted with the nuclear codes. Tom's worried. Chet's not. He'll be fine. He's not, he's not going to drop nukes on people. I, mean, I don't know. I think he's incredibly uneducated about it. I... So here, here's the thing about the codes that people don't realize. People, it's not like he has a, 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 like a piece of paper in his pocket that's like, oh, here are the nuclear codes. It doesn't work that way. What, how it works is there's a military officer that walks around with what's called a football. That officer, he's got more experience than I do. And at the end of the day, if the president goes off the handle and says, nuke these guys because I don't like them, we're taught in the military as officers that we have a moral obligation to refuse orders that are not moral. So if my commander tells me to do that and it is not moral, I have an obligation to tell him to f*** 
f off. So you tell him to f off, and then he goes, okay, you're out. So he, as the president, has somebody else take that football from you. Yeah. And he looks at the guy and goes, are you in? Because this guy's fired. Except the guy At the who very has, best, he's fired or he's going to jail. So you're telling me that Army or Navy or Air Force officers of major or lieutenant commander or whatever rank, guys who've been in the military for 15 years, are just going to go ahead, who have children's, children and families, are just going to pull the trigger because Trump decides one day, you know what, f them, I don't like them, nuke them. You're counting on the moral character of every single one of these individuals. Should we, should we not? Because that's what we're trained to do. But this comes down to trust, right? Like, say, it comes say, down to trust, absolutely. Say, say like you, I am working for a man that I completely trust. I haven't been informed of the situation at all, and he comes in and he says, this is what's got to be done. More than likely, I'll probably do it, right? So, I, I mean, I can't... But do you completely trust this man? Me? No. Sitting with these guys the night after this divisive, awful election was actually really reassuring. Not the part about possible nuclear obliteration, but it's the way they talk to each other. They disagree on everything, but they like each other so much. They work together great. They get stuff done. So many Trump and Clinton supporters. We just never talk to each other for long enough to realize we might actually get along. In this moment, when nobody seems to be listening to anybody with a different point of view, when each side vilifies the other and thinks the other side is going to destroy this country. It was calming to watch conflict play out in this way that was devoid of rage and judgment and hurt that had each person continually acknowledging the other person's humanity. After this year, I could use more of that. Stephanie Fu. Coming up, a Trump supporter explains to us the difference between gloating and simply celebrating, and a foreigner wonders if it's time to leave this country. That's in a minute from Chicago Public Radio, when a program continues. Support for This American Life comes from Audible.com, a provider of audiobooks with an unmatched selection of downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For This American Life listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook of your choice when you try Audible free for 30 days. A title they suggest is A Life in Parts, written and read by Brian Cranston. For a free 30-day trial, including a free digital audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash American. And from Mozilla, the nonprofit behind the popular web browser Firefox. For over 15 years, Mozilla has championed an open, accessible, and healthy internet for all. Now, Mozilla is introducing Firefox Focus, the new privacy browser for iPhone and iPad. From the moment you open the Firefox Focus app, it automatically blocks web trackers from following you online. No hidden settings to adjust, just tap and browse securely. Firefox Focus is available now for free from the App Store. This American Life from Ira Glass. Today on our program, the sun comes up. People around the country reacting to the news this week in all kinds of ways. The name of today's show came from President Obama's speech the day after the election. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yesterday, uh, before votes were tallied, I shot a video that some of you may have seen in which I said to the American people, uh, regardless of which side you were on in the election, uh, regardless of whether your candidate won or lost, the sun would come up in the morning. And that is one bit of prognosticating that actually came true. Uh, the sun is up. And I know everybody had a We've arrived night. at Act 6 of our show, well. Act 6, Times Square. So on election night, a young woman named Blair Imani tweeted this around 1130. Quote, I'm scared today will be the last day I feel somewhat safe wearing my hijab. I got her on the phone the next day, and she told me that she wrote that after walking through Times Square in New York, four guys walked past her, probably on their way to the Trump victory party, which wasn't that far away. They were wearing red Make America Great Again caps. She had never seen groups of Trump supporters together like that. You know, when, whenever I see men in red hats, especially, you know, just because of this election, not before, but, you know, because of this election, I kind of tense up and I wait to see what's on their 
on their hat. And when I see that it's not, you know, make America gay again, or, you know, like, it's like a parody of, uh, of Trump's campaign, uh, I kind of feel like, you know, not in my stomach. And so when I saw um, four white men walking towards me with make America great again hats, I was just kind of feeling like the anxiety. And, and were you seriously debating not wearing your hijab? I, I will always will have my head covered. Um, today, actually, I went and I uh, bought some hats. Wait, so you stopped wearing your hijab? Yeah. And um, I tweeted a picture of myself with, like, hashtag Muslim girl camo. Camo, like camouflage. She's done this in the past sometimes. Like when she has to fly, she'll wear a hat instead of hijab on the plane. On election night, there were other people tweeting things like, quote, my mom literally texted me, don't wear the hijab, please. She's the most religious person in our family. And quote, my mom and sister are actually having the conversation on whether or not they should continue wearing hijab for their own safety. In the day since then, Blair says that she's seeing more and more red hats around New York, like Trump supporters are feeling bolder now that he's won in this super liberal city, which is weird for her. But at the same time, other strangers are being especially nice to her. Before she switched to the hat on Wednesday, an older white woman on the train made a point to sit next to her and smile at her. There was a couple of situations like that. Like when I was in the checkout line getting the hats, the woman noticed that I was getting hats and like, she was like, yeah, this is bad. Do you think it's going to start to feel safer to wear hijab around New York City? I think um, I would like, I, I, I'm going to... Um, be optimistic in saying that I think yeah so I'm hoping there will be more people who you know like the the old women today who like reached out to me to just kind of make eye contact to smile and that's really my hope because um that's you know kind of that's what I feel like America should be um and I feel that you know despite what the polls show that more people in America are good than are bigoted and awful Seven, Nicholasville, Kentucky. So Donald Trump has been vague and even contradictory about some of the changes that he wants to make once he takes office. But there are some very specific things he's promised over and over. One of our producers, David Kestenbaum, talked to somebody whose life seems like it definitely will be affected. Hello? Hey, is this Billy? Hold on a second. Billy! Billy! Hello? Hey, Billy. Hey, what's up? Billy Webster is 45 years old. He lives in Kentucky, works for Hallmark, setting up the card displays at a local Walmart store. His favorite cards are probably the Star Wars ones. Is there a sorry you lost the election card? No, I've never seen that. Uh -uh. (laughs) Billy voted for Clinton, so he had the usual shock when he saw that Trump was going to win. But he also had this very specific thought watching the TV that night. What is going to happen to my health insurance? He gets his through Obamacare. What can you do about it? You hadn't thought about it, but basically like that, we all decided your health insurance the other day. Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Trump and the Republicans have, of course, promised to repeal Obamacare. And however you feel about Obamacare and how well it's working, there are something like 20 million people currently getting insurance through it. So here, just for the record, is exactly one of those stories. Hallmark, for all its Get Well cards, does not offer Billy health insurance. The job isn't full-time. He says he earned about $12,000 last year. Before that, he was unemployed, and so didn't go to a doctor. Even when stuff happened that really, honestly, you should go to a doctor if it happens to you. Thanksgiving Day, you know, I, uh, I had a big, uh, you know, big meal at Thanksgiving, and then all of a sudden I just got this, like, just rush of not, feel like, not feeling good. Like, my vision started blurring, and my, my feet tingled and hurt really bad, and I don't know, I lost my hearing. I started having a little ringing in my ears, and... Just, I don't know, kind of like an out-of-body experience. Didn't your parents or friends say, you should go to a doctor? Oh, they always tell you that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't afford it, so, yeah, they always tell you that when you're sick, you know, and you don't feel good. Yeah, go to the doctor. Well, you're going to pay for it? When Obamacare came along, Billy qualified for insurance under the Medicaid expansion part of it. it cost him about 50 bucks a month. And he finally went to a doctor who did a simple blood test and was like, yeah, you got diabetes. Yeah, I was ecstatic. I mean... You're ecstatic to be diagnosed with diabetes? No, I'm ecstatic to know what I had. The doctor prescribed some pills, and pretty quickly Billy's blood sugar levels went back into the normal range. I mean, I felt so much better after that. 
so it probably saved my life, you know, because with diabetes, you know, you can lose your eyesight, you know, lose your limbs. Trump was never very specific about what he would replace Obamacare with. Billy says, to be honest, losing health insurance would not be the end of the world. It's not like he has cancer, doesn't need heart surgery, though that is certainly the case for some other people on Obamacare. Billy told me he'd have to pay for the diabetes medication himself, which would be a strain, but he said he'd just have to find a way. And if something really went wrong, he's not just going to sit at home and die. You know, I'll go to the emergency room, you know, and then the state can pay for it or whoever else does. The people that complain about, you know, people like me or whatever that has, you know, benefited from this, then they can just pay for it out of their taxes. You know, the people of the state of Kentucky can pay for those $1,000 emergency room bills that I'll never pay. So, I mean, I try to pay them, but you know, that's just being sarcastic. Going to the emergency room with no money? That's basically the system we had before Obamacare. I asked Billy if he thought Trump and the Republicans might replace Obamacare with something better. Maybe, he said. I should just give the guy a chance. David Kestenbaum. Act 8, Greenville, South Carolina. So all this year we've been talking to Trump voters as their chances went from laughable to striking distance to victory. One guy who was all the way for Trump back in February was Barry Chisholm. His son was too. His son's Dave. Our producer Zoe Chase met them back then. They used to call up their local talk show host on the radio and crow about how great Donald Trump was. They were underdogs back then. So he checked back in this week to see how the week was going for them. Hello. Hey, Barry, it's Zoe. What's going on? You are you safe? You being safe up there or what? I'm safe. Walking around the streets in New York, good grief. Doesn't seem like they're too happy still, huh? Um, yeah. I do think a lot of people are upset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're pretty safe here in the South. We don't- yeah, I'm wearing my Trump hat today, Sam, and I'm good to go. I'm getting a lot of high fives. You're getting a lot of high fives in your Trump hat? We're deep in the deplorable country. <laughs> are you guys excited? Yeah, but to only to the what? point of celebration, not like we get satisfaction. There's a difference between... Uh, celebrating and gloating. Gloating is you're happy that someone else is sad. You're happy that someone else is stressed. That is not where our happiness or celebratory comes from. It's from the fact that we, you know, we defended this campaign and we wanted this and our guy won. It doesn't go past that. I think it's a little ridiculous. I think people are overboard with being that upset because we weren't even that upset with Obama. Yeah, we, you, you didn't see, did you remember all the deplorables out on the street when Obama got elected, punching all the, the uh, Obama voters? You remember that, right? No. No, you don't. That's why all these people that are upset, they don't realize that the good that's going to come, they're going to benefit. I think oh, potentially yeah. they're going to come around. Honestly, my, my thing is, and this is where I'll be going for it, yeah. we don't want to be rubbing it in people's face. I don't want to show people that this is going to be better. Make America Great Again includes all the citizens that are in this country, okay? Mm-hmm. So when the economy goes, everybody goes up. You just think the, the economy is just going to go gangbusters now. If you do one thing, one thing, well, you get the regulations off, you do the pipeline, you let them drill for oil, you bring the coal back, and, you know, Hillary's happy to tell people she's going to put them out of a job. That's all these people have their whole lives and generations. You know, they don't have the luxury of going out there and, and, and using, you know, their political position to, uh, you know, use the State Department to make herself a multi-millionaire. These people have to work every day for a living. It sounds like you're still mad at Hillary. Well, I'm mad at the way... No, I'm not mad at Hillary. I mean, you know, it's a difference of opinion. I mean, it's a difference of ideology. And then, yeah, well, shouldn't... Wouldn't you be mad if people were calling you racist and xenophobe? I mean, good grief. Well, so what are you so happy about? Like, what's going to happen now? Good grief. How can you not be? Look, at we've had a lawless country. The, the, the immigration law is a, a mockery to people who obey the law. Your president doing executive orders. If you do one thing, one thing, well, you get the regulations off, you do the pipeline, and then the repatriation, 
this $2 trillion. They're not going to bring it back and pay 35%. These are business people. They're not stupid. They're not going to give their hand their money over to a bunch of dopey politicians. Do you- so if they do that. Beer, you right. still sound mad. I'm saying. No, I'm excited. Still... See, I'm okay, that's you're excited. excited. Okay. okay. Because we have the opportunity to do this now. Are you nervous he's going to disappoint you now? He's not going to be as good as you thought? Do I uh, worry about can he stick to his first principles and the things that he talked about? Do of course I do. I, 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 I didn't say that, but this guy is not like the savior. This guy's not going to be the, the answer to all the problems that this country, you know, faces. But, you know, can he do some good things? I think so. Zoe Chase. Act 9, Salt Lake City. Emily Ellsworth is a lifelong Republican. Grew up Mormon in one of the most reliably Republican states in the country. Culturally, being Mormon is pretty much synonymous with being Republican. But like lots of Mormons, Emily found Donald Trump unacceptable. 175,000 Utahns voted for third-party candidate Evan McMullen. Lots more did not vote at all. Emily decided she was going to vote for Hillary Clinton after she watched the Democratic convention. She liked her. She liked the message she was sending to women. But because of where she lived, Emily's experience before the election was different from most Clinton supporters And her experience after it this week has also been. For starters, if your world is Mormon and you live in Utah, there are consequences if you support Clinton. Elna Baker explains. Even before Donald Trump won, Emily paid a price for publicly supporting Hillary Clinton. Her former co-workers stopped calling and texting. She and her younger sister are no longer on speaking terms because of their political and ideological differences. Emily wasn't even invited to her wedding ceremony. It was incredibly lonely. I didn't think I was being all that radical. I feel um, that I am standing alone out there and I don't know who has my back. You feel like you're just very exposed, you know, being out like in a field or, you know, on an island. Emily's not just a casual Republican. Her father was a precinct chair in Utah and growing up he would hold meetings in her living room. To her, the Republican Party feels like home. Literally. As in, it feels like the voice is coming from the living room. Her dad would take her to election parties and Republican state conventions. As a little girl, she'd wanted to be president. But her mother discouraged her. But still, she figured she'd run for some office one day. As an adult, she worked for two years for Republican Congressman Chris Stewart and four years for Jason Chaffetz, who was one of the most outspoken Republicans about the Benghazi attack. When Emily decided on Hillary Clinton, she went bigly. She wrote an op-ed entitled, Republican Women Should Join Me in Voting for Hillary. She started the Utah chapter of Republican Women for Hillary. She worked the phones for the Clinton campaign. She did interviews on TV. It wasn't the first time she took a stand like this. Two years earlier, Emily had been involved in a movement to get Mormon women more authority in the church. When Mormon boys turn 12, they're given the power to act in the name of God and to speak on his behalf. Girls at 12 get a trinket necklace. Women can't be priests, elders, bishops, stake presidents, patriarchs, quorum of the 70, apostles, prophets. And for the rest of their lives, it's not that women are second-class citizens. It's that their connection to God can be vetoed by a man at any time. Like if Hermione had to run all her spells past Harry Potter and wasn't allowed to have a wand, she would be pissed. Emily looked at Hillary Clinton and thought, if a woman were president, It would be hard for the Mormon church to continue saying a woman can't have authority. It'd send a message to little girls, and over time, maybe more women would demand leadership positions. Emily has a six-year-old daughter named Abigail. The same way Emily was ushered into politics as a little girl, she ushered Abigail in. They talked about Hillary Clinton a lot. She used Hillary to teach Abigail a lesson she hadn't been taught that Abigail could become president one day. Then on Tuesday, Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump, and it was devastating. I talked to Emily on Wednesday. I did not even send my daughter to school today. My daughter Abigail told me she's in first grade, that yesterday they had a mock election, and she was the only one in her class who voted for Hillary Clinton, and that her friends said, you know, tried to, she said that they tried to get her to vote for Donald Trump, and she just said, I, I wasn't going to do it. They weren't going to bully me into voting for anybody that I didn't want to. And she took great pride in that. 
I was afraid of what her classmates were going to say to her about being a, you know, a Hillary voter and a Hillary supporter. I mean, I wish I could rewind time. Like if I had been less excited about it and hadn't talked it up as much, then she wouldn't be this disappointed. And I feel like I wanted her so badly to believe that she could do anything she wanted. And now there's a part of her that does not believe that anymore. She's been painting pictures and drawing things about being president and has said that she wants to be a female president and that she was going to be next. And today she said, if Hillary can't win, I don't think I can win either. And I don't know what to tell her because I, I want to say, no, you can be anything you want. But yesterday showed us that maybe that is just not the reality yet. Let's be clear. Emily voted for Hillary Clinton, but she's not a Democrat. She's a committed Republican, and all her hopes for the country are with the GOP. But this year, she'd watched her old boss, Jason Chaffetz, and other senior Utah Republicans, Mormons, unendorse Donald Trump after the Access Hollywood tape, and then, three weeks later, re-endorse him. It was surreal, she said, to hear them describe it as this moral choice. It felt incredibly personal because these were people I had worked with and people who had told me that they really didn't like Trump, but here they were just saying, but you've got to go out and vote for him. It felt like a betrayal of her, of women, which is why she'd hoped Donald Trump would lose and Hillary Clinton would win. In my mind, this would have been a true wake-up call that we needed to expand who we were reaching and we needed to let go of some of these ideas that were unpopular with women and uh, minorities and immigrants. And now that that didn't happen, what does it mean for the Republican Party? They got their pass. And I think that sends a signal to the Republican Party that Donald Trump has it right. It makes me feel like that there's not a place for me in a position of leadership in my church, in my party, or in the presidency. I'm not allowed to have the priesthood, I'm not allowed to have the presidency. And it just feels like another slap in the face, that there are certain things that women are just not allowed to have. Emily's in a real predicament now. She was so vocal about supporting Hillary Clinton. If she hadn't been, she said, or if Clinton had won and Trump had lost. In four years, she could have run for something. Not president, of course. Something local, something small, a place to start. Now, that's not going to happen. Elna Baker. Act 10, New York. President-elect Donald Trump has made it clear that he's going to be tough on both legal and illegal immigrants. That means many immigrants in this country got scared when he won. So he chase sat in the day after the election with some immigration lawyers who are getting nervous calls from their clients. There are two types of worries in this world. One's based on a real threat and one's based on a feeling. And this week, immigration lawyers are sorting through both of those. This is an email that Cheryl David, a longtime immigration lawyer in New York, woke up to this morning. Hi, Cheryl. I'm in total shock for the election result. I'm literally in disbelief. I slept three hours total. She's reading this to me and my friend, Lindsay Gaza, who's also her associate. They spent the day after the election at their office. The email is about one of their clients. Is it premature to ask uh, for asylum in Canada? I'm worried that my own green card will be revoked as I come from a country that has Syrian refugees. Please let me know your thoughts. I'm in total political disarray. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs> Revoke my green card because I'm from a country that has Syrian refugees. refugees. Like, that's insane. On one hand, on the other hand, it's like, oh, that makes sense. We do hate Syrian refugees, apparently, in this country. During the election, President-elect Trump said a couple things about immigrants that have freaked out these lawyers and their clients. Keep out Muslim refugees. Build a wall. They obviously don't know if Trump is going to do any of that as president or how that will change their jobs. And they hadn't seriously considered that Trump's views on immigration would become the law. Like, really not. Especially lately, they'd been super excited about Hillary Clinton. Cheryl the most. She's the boss. This is an all-lady office. No men work here. 
The day I was there, they'd watched Hillary Clinton's concession speech in the dark in Cheryl's office, sobbing, they said. We spend a lot of time together. We talk about this stuff all day long. We've been talking about the election for two years, for two years every single day. Mm-hmm. And yesterday we felt so positive. We were talking about a matriarchy. <laughs> we no, so- it, didn't even, it didn't even enter my mind yesterday that she would lose. It's devastating. The thing that feels like the legit worry is that all of President Obama's executive orders will be repealed on day one. Trump said over and over he would do this, and that will affect a lot of their immigration cases. For instance, DACA. This is a status for young adults who came here as children illegally, most of them brought by their parents, the DREAM Act kids. DACA lets them stay in the country and work. It's renewable every two years, unless it isn't anymore. Cheryl reads me another email they got early that morning. Hi, Andrea or Cheryl. I'm sure you're getting flooded with emails about Trump and his position on deporting DACA members. What should expect to happen with my application and future? They don't know the answer. It feels too soon to have the question. But it doesn't look good for this client. Really, the the ones that I'm, I am a little concerned, I'm concerned about the DACA, because I think he will take the DACA. I think they're going to end the DACA program. I don't think he'll take it away from the people who have it, but they won't be allowed to renew it because it's an executive order. So I think executive orders are over, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm pretty straight with clients. I don't sugarcoat. So so what did you say? I said I think it's going to take it away. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah. And, what, you know, why sugarcoat it? Hello? Hello? How's life? Uh, okay. You know, I'm worried about, like, you know, you know, Trump, you know, is, um, like his policies. Uh huh. He's Jamaican. He's got a green card. Lots of the clients here are in this country legally. They have a green card or a valid visa, but they've committed crimes that make them deportable. This guy's like that. Obviously, these are people Donald Trump has said he wants to deport. Yeah. President Obama has also targeted them. These lawyers think, even under President Trump, this guy's a pretty good case to stay here. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you're already you're already in a situation where immigration has already come to your you you have come to their attention. So, yeah. for your purposes, like the worst has already happened, and we're taking care of it. Yeah, and, and it's it's not it's not going to get worse for you right now. I mean, you're eligible for relief. There has been no talk of him making it worse for people who are already green card holders. This is an example of the other kind of call they've been getting all day. Just generalized anxiety. No particular reason. Just, has my case changed now? Is everything different? I mean, are things going to change? I think so, but not for you. I hope. I I don't, I don't, I don't, there's no sign that it will change for you. Okay, I appreciate it. Not just one heads up, you know? Yeah, no, I I don't blame you. We're all, we're all panicking. Yeah, I know, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Lynn says she knows how it is under President Obama. Like, she knows how to react and advise her clients. She knows when they're safe and when they are not. And I've felt pretty confident in the last five years to say, I can take you, even though you have a deportation order, you have a path forward, we can get rid of it, we can get you a green card. And, you know, come with me, I will walk you into this office, we will have an interview with with the government, they will not arrest you. That maybe isn't true anymore, and we won't know until they start arresting people. You know, they're not going to put out a a statement saying, our crackdown looks like this. Exactly, exactly. They're just going to start doing it around the... It's going to be different all over the country. So you're going to have advocates in San Francisco saying, it's happening like this. Atlanta's going to be having a different scenario. New York, who knows? So it just feels like really anxiety-inducing for me, and I'm not even the person who is being marched into the government's offices. You know, it's not my life. We were talking about this a little bit before, but like, I don't, it's a terrible feeling to not know how to advise your clients when they call. You know, usually it's like, if I don't know the answer, I can go to Cheryl and Cheryl almost always knows the answer and we can figure it out. We can, you know, think about the law. We can look at cases this it's like we we don't know i mean we have we have lists of of clients who are waiting for us to do certain applications we've been preparing to file that now we're not sure if we can and we're not going to know the answer for a while i mean there's and i think we don't know the answer because i don't think he knows what he he wants to do frankly i think as a president he doesn't know what he wants to do 
I mean, I guess he could build his wall and he'll be busy building the wall and maybe forget about other parts of immigration. And once the wall is built, he'll look at the policy so we might be safe. <laughs> right. Brick right. by brick. A lot of immigration lawyers around the country are worried and confused, and they got in touch with each other this week. Conference calls, webinars, Facebook posts, they're in uncharted territory, lots of them, and they don't know what to think. Once they have the new rules, they'll get a new strategy. It's the not knowing that's painful for lawyers. Zoe Chase, Act 11, Toledo, Ohio. So the youngest person on our production staff is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Jochi. He's 23, grew up in Toledo, Ohio. But he's British. His dad's company would move their family around a lot. His dad worked in marketing. And so they've lived in England and in Belgium and here in the United States in Ohio. And late on election night, just before midnight Eastern time, Emmanuel was the last person at the office. And he got on the phone to his mom back home in Ohio and recorded the conversation. I called my mom because after watching America vote this anti-immigrant candidate into the presidency, I had this vague panic that all of a sudden I wasn't welcome here anymore. We're the only black family in our neighborhood in Toledo. We used to be the only Brits too, but somehow our suburb has more of those than other black people. And I know this election has been hard on my mom. Our friends and our neighbors tell her their anti-immigrant views. They forget she's an immigrant because she's been here so long. And they forget she's black because she's English. They say all kinds of things about Black Lives Matter or the Obamas. Come election time in this country, people who otherwise seem quite normal, rational people, suddenly saying the most outlandish and hurtful things. And they don't even seem to realize that the things that they are saying are extremely hurtful and offensive to me. <sighs> okay, mommy. I don't know. You know, you just feel that the general populace clearly don't want you here. After all, when Donald Trump started <clears throat> denouncing the HB1 visa as well, that's the visa under which we came here. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know? I didn't realize until she said it, like, right then. That's us. Like, that exact thing is us. The H-1B visa. I'd seen him talk about that. You know, we do have our green cards. We are legally here as permanent residents. The only thing is, is that our green cards come up for renewal in a year or two. So we have to decide. Either we decide to plunge all in and go for citizenship, or we renew. But then, you know, renewal may be difficult. Uh, or maybe just go. <laughs> When she said this, I thought, but I want to stay. I really want to stay. And I want you to stay. Six months ago, we had a big conversation about applying for citizenship. A few days later, I put in the form. But she never mentioned it again, so I knew she hadn't applied. This didn't feel like the time to bring it up. By more immediate concerns, it's, you know, so what's it going to be like living day to day in this climate and environment? You know, I hadn't shared it with you, but I had a very nasty experience just last week in the car park at Kroger. Wait, wait, wait. So, so what, how did this happen? Kroger's is the local supermarket. Apparently when she pulled in, she had to stop suddenly to avoid a guy walking out of the store with his kids. Thinking nothing was wrong, she parks in the spot right next to the guy. She was with my kid sister, Marissa, who's 16. And he was clearly, you know, saying something and, you know, mouthing off inside the car. So I stopped and then he rolled his window down. And there just a uh, sort of a whole uh, torrent of abuse at me. Uh, hey, what did he say? About, oh, how I should and shouldn't be driving in the car park and blah, 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 and I'm speeding around the car park. And I said, uh, no, in fact, you know, I was actually being very careful. And you know, I, said, I said, well, you know, you really don't need to worry. So, you know, sort of, I'm always very careful. Uh, and then he, then he started shouting, me, get away from my car, get away, don't touch my car. I said, well, I'm not touching your car. I said, you know, 
I'm not doing anything. I'm just standing here. And he's just saying, get away from my car. If you don't get away from my car, I'm calling the police. At which point, you know, Marissa started saying, Mommy, Mommy, just leave it, just leave it. So, you know, so I just said, I, and then it suddenly, it just suddenly hit me. I was thinking, oh my God. And looking at the guy and his face, the way, and then suddenly I realized what it was all about. It was just like, it was a racial thing. You know that trope about immigrant kids translating for their parents who don't speak English? It's true even for parents who speak the Queen's English. My sister translated the situation for my mother. You know, Marissa, she was really going on and on at me. And she was just saying, I mean, why did you bother to talk to that man? Couldn't you realize that you understand? I said, I don't know. I, I, I said, clearly I'm missing something because I don't see what I have to understand. And she said, he's a white man with his two children. If the police had come, they wouldn't have listened to you. They would have immediately taken his side and they would have done something bad to you. And I said, you really believe that? She said, oh, I know it. She said, you don't seem to understand, Mummy. I've actually grown up in this country. You haven't. But you don't understand how these people are and how they think. But that's what would have happened to you. And it just, it was just really, really horrible. And it really shook me up badly. Then came the words I'd been dreading. I was just thinking, I think it's time for our American experiment to end. Yeah. I was actually thinking you were going to say that. I don't know. For some reason, that, that, that was my first reaction to the news was that's what...